Today I'd like to talk to you about the two sides to getting started with CNC. The light side and the dark side. I want to go over all the struggles I've had with learning the CNC, what's went wrong, the things I don't like about it, that kind of thing. So here's the deal. The video was going to be about 40 minutes long if I did both positive and negative in the same video. So what I've decided to do is split these videos into two parts. So this part is the negative, the dark side. You're going to get that first. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, click the bell icon, click all so you get notified of all the new content. That way when my video comes out with all the positives, you won't miss it. This video is brought to you by 731woodworks.com. Go check our store out. We have easy to follow build plans as well as products and merchandise for you to check out. That directly supports us and helps us make videos like this. I think on the negative side is I set myself up for failure more than anything. I thought that I would get this CNC in the shop I would set it up and then I could just pick up files from online somewhere, put it on the computer and tell it to go and let it go. That's not the case most of the time. Carbide has a website called Cut Rocket. There's not a bunch of them. You run out of files to use very quickly. I bought several on Etsy and then when I get them, they're just SVGs. I thought they would be Carbide 3D files. And when, when you get an SVG file, you've got to program everything in there just like you're building your own. So you have to set the tool pass so that everything knows what bit it's using, what feed it's using, how deep to cut. The whole nine yards, the only thing you've got is basically the outline of the project. Someone out there, one of these CNC companies, Carbide Anybody, would be miles ahead of the other ones if they could come up with a way to say, okay, here's a piece or here's a file. All you have to do is set the thickness of your material and go. That would put them miles ahead of everybody else because that's one of the things a beginner wants to do. You want to make stuff, but you don't want to learn how to program the files personally and all that. You just want to take the file, put it in the machine and let it go. CNC companies where you at. Y'all got to get this going and get some files readily available for your users to actually start making products and not just three or four or 10 or 15, a good 100, 200 different projects for them to start working and building things would be phenomenal. I've had multiple failures as far as I didn't program the CNC to do what I thought it was gonna do. If you're proficient with software, you can overcome those things. If you have a hard time struggling with computers and figuring out things, programs, things like that, you're gonna struggle with this as well. I feel like I'm fairly proficient with computers and I've struggled quite a bit with this thing. And a lot of times it's, I didn't understand why the CNC was gonna do certain things. For instance, the thickness or the depth of your material has to be programmed in. Even if you get a file from the internet and tell the CNC to cut, you've got to set those parameters on every project. That's one of some of my failings have come in is at first, the first several projects that I was cutting, I didn't realize that how important that was or that the file that I was getting from the internet had to be tweaked. It's probably very obvious to a lot of people, but that's something I, I kind of skipped over and didn't realize. I have broke a couple of bits so far and those bits are 20, 30, $40 a piece, not programming the depth correctly or not realizing that it was gonna cut into this aluminum here and it would actually get down in there when it started making the curve or whatever, it would break it off. I still haven't put a spool board on top. I'm still using the one that came with it. You can see the grooves uh, where things have been cut out. I mean, they're, it's wasteboard, it's supposed to be that way. These are easily replaceable with three quarter inch MDF. I'm not concerned about it. Another thing I didn't realize was in the software, it has various materials and they all have the same bits. So you would look at MDF or hardwood or softwood and it would have a one eighth inch end mill and you would have to pick that. And I just thought one was one, but no, it's not because each material has a certain feed rate or speed that the CNC is gonna be operating at. And you wanna set that to the material you're using. So hardwoods, it's gonna be slower. MDF, things like that will be faster. If you don't know, the Shapeco 4 uses Carbide Create software. There are other softwares available that you can use to write code to run the CNC on, but they're very expensive. Carbide Create is free. You can download that right now and play with it. There's an upgraded version that adds a few extra things, but for the most part, you can do most things with the free version. So you take Carbide Create, and that's, what, that's where you set all the tool paths and what you want the machine to do. And then you save that into G-code. It's basically a language that another program can read called Carbide Motion. Carbide Motion is what I have on this laptop. And that basically tells the CNC what to do. So if everything does what it's supposed to, everything should work right. 
However, I had one glitch on a mallet I was making. I bought some files from Two Moose Designs, excellent files, excellent mallets they make. You can check those out, link in the description. Everything worked good for the first three files. The first three mallets I made come out perfect. I used the same file, everything. Like all I did was push start again to make another mallet. And about halfway through it, the machine actually just drug the spindle across at full depth of cut through Purple Heart. It made some of the worst sounds that you can imagine. Like it sounded like a car crash, just screeching and the spindle was screaming out, please help me, please help me. Cause it was putting it some really hard tension on it. I was pretty frustrated that it, it destroyed a piece of Purple Heart. I reset up everything and I started again. The exact same thing happened on the second time. I wound up unplugging everything and then replugging everything back up and doing it again on a new piece of wood. It worked perfectly fine. Somehow on the fourth rendition of the same file using the same G code, there something happened in there where it didn't retract the spindle when it was moving to start a new cut. I don't know why. I reached out to several people with CNC's. It's just kind of one of those things that happens sometimes, which is another reason why you can't leave this thing alone. Another thing that I was sadly mistaken on was the speed at which this thing cuts. I thought that I could lay a piece of material up there tell it to cut. Five or 10 minutes later, I've got a finished piece and that's not the case. It takes sometimes hours or a couple of hours. This is half inch MDF. I cut out 14 of these on a 29 by 29 piece of MDF. It takes almost two hours to cut out 14 of these. And speaking of carbide motion or any 3D modeling software, it's actually 2D unless you upgrade. If you had the time to sit down and study the software, there's a bunch of videos on YouTube going through all of the software. You can certainly do that and probably learn at a lot faster rate than I have. Another dark side of the CNC is I actually had a spindle failure while operating this thing. And that's one of those things where you think you're gonna be able to set this and forget it, but you can't because that's an electrical appliance that's up there running it's be like you, you don't you shouldn't leave your house with the dryer going or something like that like it's just it's not good business so i actually had a spindle failure as you see here sparks were shooting out from the bottom of it as well as from the top uh, i was in the shop when it happened i had earphones in or ear protection on but you can still hear the pitch change i heard the pitch change i looked over and saw the sparks i sh shut it off and i turned it back on for a couple of times to see what was going on now two carbides credit i reached out to them and told them what was going on they suggested i change the brushes, which is extremely easy. You just take this little covers off with a flathead screwdriver and they drop right in. It's, that still didn't help. I did see that one brush was extremely burned up or used up. And then I changed the brushes. It was still doing that, but they overnighted me a new spindle. And that's the one you see in there now. I changed that out. I did pick up a Makita spindle just in case this one goes out. I think it was likely my fault because up until that point, I was running it on number six, which is full speed on everything. I thought pedal to the metal all, all the time. I, that's not the case. It actually works better if you turn it down to the recommended speed, which is usually about a three or 18,000 RPMs. It cuts better, it cuts cleaner. Also another issue I've had with this Shipeco 4 is sometimes when you initialize a machine, it'll actually go to the back right. And when it gets there, sometimes these homing switches on the side uh, won't activate correctly and it'll, it'll start like kind of bumping up against it and making a kind of a grinding noise. And then on the computer screen, you'll see it'll say failed initiation or something like that. This is kind of a dark side, but kind of a positive thing. So I'm gonna throw it in here in the middle. You need a bit setter. It's extremely well worth the money because once you put the bit in, it'll come over and touch off of this. It knows where it's at in the Z axis at that point. So if you change bits during a cut, it'll come back over and touch off after you've changed the bit. This thing will save you tons of time and make your cuts lots more accurate. I wouldn't want this machine without a bit setter. So be sure and check those out. Another dark side. This is the clamp that comes with the thing. And while they work extremely well, most of the time they get in the way. Sometimes your spindle or actually this dust collection boot will hit the thing and then cause you some problems. I've been using double-sided tape and I use a lot of it. This is just regular double-sided tape. I'll put the link in the description below to some good stuff. This works extremely well. I've had no issues only using double-sided tape. I've seen people, some people use masking tape with CA glue. I can see where that could get fairly expensive. This, I think this stuff's a couple dollars a roll or so. It's very inexpensive and it holds the work extremely well so long as you're just cutting out trays, 
templates, things like that. Another dark side of CNC that uh, is not talked about a lot is dust collection. Right now I'm using a shop vac. This is a rigid, I think it's a 13 gallon or 14 gallon shop vac over there. It, it works well, but it does get a little static build up uh, in the hose. You can actually come up and touch it and it'll kind of shock you a little bit. It's a little concerning that there's static build up there. I've got dust collection in route from Laguna. I ordered a big dust collector that'll be here, Lord willing, in November or so. But for now, I'm using the shop bag and it works extremely well. Uh, even cutting MDF, things like that, you just have to keep it cleaned out fairly regularly and just keep an eye on it. Cost of entry. I didn't buy this. Carbide 3D sent this to me after I pitched them the idea that I wanted to make a video series on these. And I reached out to multiple companies and Carbide was the only one that agreed to do it. So I'd like to thank them and their link to their websites in the description. They put no stipulations on anything. I'm not getting paid by them uh, monetarily. I'm not an affiliate with them or anything like that at this point. So this is just my thoughts and feelings on the CNC. But the cost of entry to a CNC is fairly steep at about 2,500 to 3,000 for one this size with everything you need to get started. However, we'll talk some more about that in the light side of things because you can actually make some money with this thing if it's working. It's no different than if you go to work, you make money. If this thing's sitting in the corner, it's not gonna make you any money, but that's part of getting started. So you need to probably, if you've never used a CNC, my advice is to expect the first month or two to not make any money while you're learning to use the machine and the software. The cost of the bits to get started is fairly expensive. I think I paid a couple hundred dollars for a starter kit from Bits and Bits. I've got a discount code if you're interested in that down there to get you started. The most used bits I'm using are 1 8 inch and quarter inch end mills or they're just straight bits basically. And they'll just cut things out. So they'll cut things out like this where they, where you can cut trays and cut out things or contour as the software calls it. You can get cheap bits. They're not gonna last very long. I prefer the Astro coated from Bits and Bits. The ones that I bought initially are still going good. I've cut tons of stuff. Hardwood, this is I think Mora. It's extremely hard wood. It'll still cutting these out great. For the MDF and things I've been cutting out, it cuts super clean and they just, they work well. I also use CMT bits on this thing that I get from taytools.com. They work excellent. Uh, I can get you a 10% discount code on those if you're interested. I'll put that in the description as well. I, I really like both bits. I prefer the Astro coated, but the CMT bits are a little less expensive and they work extremely well too. Another thing you need to consider is where you're going to sell this stuff that you're making. Or if you don't have a, a business plan or a plan of action on where you're going to sell these products, they're just going to stack up on you. And I don't know about you, but I don't have room for a bunch of stock in my area. I had to figure out what we're going to do. We're going to make these one at a time, what type of op projects we're going to make so that we can keep stock when we need to, and then also not fill up. So like these mallet templates, they don't take up a whole lot of space. So that's awesome. And so if you notice in the, in the background on a lot of my videos, this shelf over here that the paint and stuff is, is gone now. I actually moved it into the studio and then I consolidated the paint down to only what I needed. And this freed up a lot of space, not only in here, but it also gave me a place to stock items in the house or give me a place to stock this stuff. And then you're also gonna have to ship this stuff somewhere uh, if, it's not, if you're not selling it locally. And shipping supplies are extremely expensive. I don't know if you know that or not, but I went to Uline and was gonna buy some shipping boxes that would just fit these. And uh, while the boxes are like 90 cents a piece, which isn't terrible, they wanted like $120 to ship me 100 boxes. And I'm like, man, I don't think so. It's not cost effective. I can't operate like that as a small business. What I ended up doing was getting these bubble mailers from Amazon. Tape's cheap. Bubble wrap's fairly inexpensive. Uh, if you're interested in any of that stuff, I'll put links in the description to the bubble wrap bubble mailers. I'm using USPS for shipping. If they pick up here locally at my house, I just schedule the pickup for the next day so I don't have to go to the post office every day. That makes it extremely easy. But the cost of the shipping projects has to go into the cost of your product. I actually had somebody email me and complain about the shipping cost on a mallet. They're saying, well, I'm paying $13 for the mallet template. Why am I having to pay for shipping? Well, shipping uh, anywhere in the United States from here costs between eight and $12, depending on where they're at. And so even the next state over is $8 from Arkansas to California is like 12. My website automatically calculates the shipping depending on where you're at based on the size of the package I told it I was gonna be shipping. Shipping costs, so if I, if I sell the template and then also don't add shipping on there, if it's free shipping, 
then I'm gonna be losing money by the time I add packaging and all that stuff. So that's why there's shipping costs. So this, I could add free shipping, but the cost of this would go up to 20, $22, something like that. That's just one of those balancing acts you gotta to try to figure out whether it's worth charging shipping or raising the cost of the product to include shipping and packaging, things like that. That's probably one of the most common questions I get is how to ship. And all I can tell you is shipping ain't easy. So the dark side is that there's a fairly steep learning curve to the software, uh, for me at least the high cost of entry for both the machine as well as the bits and all the accessories you need to go with this thing. And then also it's just frustrating when the thing doesn't do right, especially if you're tearing up wood, especially good wood like Purple Heart. That's very frustrating. It, it makes me angry and wanna throw stuff. It's just how it is. If you wanna see when I first got the Shapeco and set it up and the first few things that I made with it, you'll click that box right there. If you wanna see the positive video, my video, you'll click that box right there. Click in either one of those boxes, Get you that big old virtual fist pump.